Hello, everyone. Welcome back for another podcast here with the Stock Talk podcast. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to my other videos. And we have another great guest here today. We have Benj Gallander here with us from Contra the Herd. And uh, we did a, a little teaser video there the other week where we talked about a few things. And I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware he was coming on here. Benj, uh, he, he's involved in many different things. He's far more experienced than I am. He's been at this for a long, long time and very successful at it. So we're going to go over some of his credentials and some of the things he's involved in. And we're lucky to have him here. He's usually on BNN television and doing all kinds of other things. So uh, thank you, Ben, for taking the time to come out here and talk to me. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, and thanks for inviting me, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, great. So, you know, it's kind of funny. We're sitting here, and uh, as we're recording this live on the 23rd of February, it's kind of a red day for the markets. Uh, I, I received a lot of feedback today for some people that are a little confused and uh, wondering where it's going to go from here. So it's kind of good timing for the type of topics we're going to go over. I think it's actually good timing where people are probably wanting to hear how, how do we react to these type of situations? What do we think of the current market environment? So we're going to get into a lot of that stuff and we're going to go back and forth on some of those subjects there. Um, what I'm going to do here, Ben, is just to get started here. Uh, first of all, I'll Grab your book here. So I've got your book up on display there. So um, this is the uh, contra the Contrarian Investors 13 book. Benj has a few different books. This would be his most recent one, right, Benj? This is your most recent release? It is indeed. And so it's the Contrarian's uh, Investors 13. And you can get this through your website. Benj, you said you even offer some autographing and personalization if people get it through your website. Happy to do it. Happy to dedicate it for the person who orders it. Or if they want to order a couple copies, we have it for a friend, family member. The, the book bestseller, both in hardcover and softcover, put out by Penguin. Um, very proud of it. Uh, the copy that I'll actually be sending will be uh, have a different cover to it, but it's actually the same book. Okay, good. Yeah, and I mean, uh, it's something that... Uh... You know, this is you haven't had to necessarily go back and revise your strategies in this book on a month to month basis. There's a lot of strategies in here that you probably used for many years, right? Oh, it's uh, I like to think that it's a classic. It goes on forever. The, the stock book that I wrote before The Uncommon Investor, which was family and friends getting together, uh, seventh game of the World Series, Blue Jays, New York Mets. It was more of a story. As a background, baseball, the background, investing is the foreground. This one is much more in depth, just about investing. Have my techniques changed much since that came out? Not very much. Uh, we continue to tweak the system to some degree, but that's pretty much where I stand. Okay. And uh, for anyone who's listening here, I'm just showing Benj's book here. And again, it's the Contrarian Investors 13. And we're going to go through his website shortly as well, where you can look that up. And uh, he's nice enough to even do some autographing for you there. It might devalue the book when I autograph it, but you know, <laughs> investing is a risk. People have to take a bit of a risk and my handwriting is horrible. So hopefully people can read it. I'm sure, I'm sure they'll, they they'll, I'm sure they'll make their way through it. No problem in the contents as well. What's important to, uh, People told me I should have been a doctor with the way my handwriting was. So we, we all. Uh... <laughs> well, they, they switched me in grade school because it used to be bad if you were lefty. Oh. You probably, I don't know if you know this at all. So they switched me from being a lefty to a righty. I'm actually ambidextrous. But okay. Lefty was the hand that I wrote with. And uh, I never quite recovered. <laughs> what can I say? You know, it's I'm from Sault Ste. Marie, and when I was in grade school there, they had a rule in grade five that you couldn't, you know, we, we were using a pencil, and we were, we were able to erase our mistakes and correct our writing, and that was the year they graduated people to a pen, and but you had to earn it. Mm. There was a little exercise that you had to do, and they had to feel confident that you weren't making mistakes. I never, I, I kept using the pencil, and I was the last one, and then they just said, okay, you can use the pen now. <laughs> I didn't really earn it, though. <laughs> Well, graduation happens at different paces, different speeds. Eventually, you you caught up. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Now, I'm just going to share the screen here. And uh, just so everyone's aware here, this is uh, his website for Bench Gallander here and his partners, his business partners, uh, Contra the Herd, ContraTheHerd.com. You have a newsletter as well, Benj, and I see that you you publicly post your returns, right? I mean, you're actually very honest about how you've done over the years. We post them all if anybody wants to look at them year by year. Uh, it's on the website. I mean, the 18.1% over 20 years annualized is amongst the best out there. Um, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. Investment Letters in its 26th year. I've been investing for over 40 years. So it's, I do find it kind of scary. I, actually, I've invested for about 45 years. I started when I was still a teenager. And a friend of mine was a stockbroker. So I would go down to uh, the security office where I worked and I'd hang out and I'd use value line. And uh, I gradually came up with a system and kept on evolving the system. But it's hard to believe how long I've been doing it for. Sometimes I can feel it, but uh, other times not so much. I remember my uncle Harry Wiseman, when he, he would golf when he was 85, he, he would say, you know, the body feels it, but the mind feels like a teenager. <laughs> so something like that. But it's, it's the process of aging. Well, you know what, too, I'll be honest with you. Uh, one of the reasons why I ended up taking a liking to you on BNN and some of the other investors I follow is because you just seem like a nice guy. Like even after talking to you personally, you don't act like a different person on camera. You just kind of seemed like you took that attitude you said there from your uncle where you seem to generally be a pretty happy person. And I, I think even when you're investing, you've set it up in such a way where, you know, you can life goes on and no matter what happens in the market, mm -hmm. it seems like. You have a, a kind of a, a cool temperament. Well, I think work-life balance is really important. Um, I don't always keep things aligned perfectly, that's for sure. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a process in a lot of ways. Certainly when I make big mistakes, sometimes I beat up on myself. But overall, uh, I realize how fortunate I am, even in a pandemic you know, we've got space in our house, a great backyard, have a river behind the house, the Humber River. We've walked on it or snowshoed on it four times in the past few weeks. We're very, very lucky. And uh, But no, no question, there's been times where I've been upset with myself. It will continue to happen. But life is short, as you know, Mike. And yeah. It, it doesn't matter if you live to be 100 years old. Life is ultimately pretty short. So uh, I think the key is to really try and enjoy it. And don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> you know, don't sweat it. You know, it, it's funny. It's like you just took the words out of my mouth. I say those things a lot. I say life is short regularly. And uh, I really try not to sweat the small stuff. Obviously, something important happens. You have to pay attention to it. But, um, you know, we all know people from other countries like we're lucky to be in canada my family came from italy mm. you know i'm lucky i'm here um you know i i'm a cancer survivor there's people that have health issues there's all kinds of stuff going on that i think sometimes it puts things into perspective and it's like hey you know let's enjoy the moment we're stuck in giant inside during lockdown you're out doing snowshoeing and family activities i'm cooking good food i'm playing music i'm doing mm. other things i mean we have to make the best of it. And if you don't, life just passes you by, right? Absolutely. And I'll tell you one thing I do. I'm, uh, when we used to have birthday parties in the family, sometimes we would have lobster, which was a very special occasion. And what I do now sometimes is when I kind of down, I'll phone up Sobeys. I'll have them steam me up lobster. It's actually cheaper than if you buy it live, which makes no sense. <laughs> they do all the work. I'll pick up the lobsters, usually two lobsters. I'll bring them home. I'll eat them. And, you know, if you're buying it directly from the grocery, they're not that expensive. It's not like a restaurant. And when I'm eating the lobster, I'll think, you know, life can't be so bad. I'm sitting here eating lobster. <laughs> and I told that to my nephew, Lee, one of my nephews, and every once in a while, I bring it up saying, can't be too bad. I'm 
I'm doing okay. And fortunately, my better half uh, is a wonderful cook. And uh, eating her leftovers is a pleasure, which I just, which I just did for lunch. Uh, you know, if you're going to wait for me to disagree with you there, I grew up Italian. I like my food too. So I think mm. that I, I agree with you on that. But whatever it is, whatever oh, it I is. Had, I had spaghetti carbonara for lunch. Oh, wow. Which she made. Okay. Oh. Wow. You're, you're Bellissimo. Do you say Bellissimo? I don't know. Bellissimo. Bellissimo. There you go. Bellissimo. Bellissimo. <laughs> that's, that's about all I know in Italian. Yeah, you know what? It's it's nice to appreciate whether it's good food or good music or good company, whatever it is that you have around you. It's 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 important to appreciate it right now because it's an easy time to really get down on things. And uh, I try to keep a positive attitude because again, life is short. You know, they say smile while you still have teeth, right? So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, today, as you mentioned, today's been a tough day in the market for a lot of people. And I guess, as you mentioned to me, I didn't even realize, I mean, some of the hot numbers like Tesla, Bitcoin, I'm sure a lot more, they got the crap kicked out of them early, though they came back somewhat. And one of the difficulties in the market right now is you've got so many newbies, so many people doing the Robin Hood thing yeah. and, and others that they haven't seen necessarily a big market drop. And they might have been involved in March when the market got badly beaten. But a lot of people don't know how to react when the market really gets hit. And the tendency then can be to panic. And panicking in the, num in the market is a major, major mistake. Although I'll contradict myself and say one of my sayings is uh, you want to panic before everybody else. So effectively, mm -hmm. when the market's not panicking and people aren't panicking, you want to say, I don't like this. I want to get out of this. It's certainly easier said than done, but that's absolutely critical. But, you know, what we're seeing in the markets now are record levels. We're seeing valuations that don't make any sense relative to history. We're seeing a lot of people who think that stocks and cryptocurrencies are going to keep on going up forever. Um, back in 1999, when you had the techs going crazy, I remember being on CBC this morning radio program, which is number one in Canada. And I was on with a, a very, you know, very smart woman who worked for one of the big companies. She was saying, you know, we're in a new paradigm. This is a new paradigm. Things are going to keep going. And I said to her, there's nothing. There are no new paradigms. There are new technologies. And at that point, new technologies was, was, were huge, but no new paradigms. And I said, you know, the, the market is basically cruising for bruising. And uh, my timing on that one was mighty good. In 2008, I was early, uh, not too early. And as you know, I write for the Globe and Mail. Yeah. And I wrote an article in January called, about market time and saying how what I'm doing now is I'm tending to sell more and buy less. So that's my way to market time because, you know, as we've met, I've been doing it a long time. I make lots of mistakes. I know I'm very fallible. Um, but for me to play market time, if I'm taking money off the market, out of the market, when my stocks hit an initial sell target or beyond, or taking out a bit more of each position, that means that I am hedging risk, so to speak. Mm -hmm. By buying less stocks, it's the same thing, I'm mitigating risk. So to me, that's absolutely critical. Now that article in the Globe, I think it had more responses than any I've ever seen on the website. It had 49 responses and many of them we're not very complimentary, which is fine. <laughs> I could handle it. A lot of people were saying, well, how come your returns aren't posted? It doesn't make any sense. You don't say, all they had to do was go to our website. Yeah. But other defenders came up and said, you know, look at what this guy has done. I mean, we'll see if I'm right. And when I'm right, it's easy to say the market's going to take a beating because we know it will. But if it doesn't take it for five years, that means I was effectively wrong right. because... I was too early. 
if it takes it within the next year or sooner, I think it's a pretty good call. So we'll see. But that's how I play it. Uh, I think people get really scared and they jump out and they sell and they're very haphazard about it, which I think is stupid. <laughs> How's that? And, and the thing is that a strategy that seems great to one person might seem horrible to the next. And it, it, it could be sometimes because they don't fundamentally understand each other's views on it. Or sometimes people just have a different philosophy, you know, and not everyone's we're not neither one of us will be right on the timing of things on a regular basis because we can't predict covid we can't predict a tsunami we can't mm -hmm. predict a lot of those things right so at the end of the day we have to be aware that we will not be able to predict some of these things for sure oh absolutely i mean covid was that was a real black swan obviously unlike anything i guess going back to 1918 with the spanish flu and COVID to me doesn't even compare. I mean, with the, the flu, um, what was it? was it? 50 million people died in a much smaller population. With COVID thus far, there's been a bit over 2 million people in a population of 8 billion. Of course, we've done things to try and avoid deaths, mm -hmm. um, but there's just, there's absolutely no comparison, but yeah. You've got to know things are going to happen that you can't uh, know about. Often the markets get beaten badly when things happen that don't seem that big, and then again people get get scared and they run for yeah. the for the mark they run from the market. Now, what I want to do here is um, I'm just going to share my screen here, and because uh, we rolled right into this topic here, so. You can see the headlines here, Tesla drops as much as 13% to turn negative for the year. All these scary headlines happening here. Um, and that's in relation to today's drop. The, the Fed Chair Powell was speaking today. They were saying that that was the reason for the drop today. I don't even know if I agree with that. I think people are just waiting for the stimulus and it could have dropped even if Powell wasn't speaking. And uh, when I go to the chart here, Benj, uh, you know, there's a channel that I draw here where it was traveling somewhat in a channel on the way up here. And there's past instances for the market where it tends to kind of go in a certain direction for a while until the next catalyst comes. And um, you'll just see that there's certain stretches here where the market will go up for a, for a stretch. It goes up for a while, but then comes the dip, then comes the dip. And right now, who knows if we go into a further dip, right? We don't, we don't know, as you were saying, um, what I was telling people on Sunday, I have some coaching students and folks I was talking to, I just pointed out that when we approach the top of this channel here, unless there's a reason to go higher, it's actually quite normal for markets to dip and they say it moves like a staircase on the way up. That's exactly what we've done. And I kind of took the approach like you said, well, I don't know if it's going to go down for sure, but I've made money here. And when it started going flat and we were waiting for the stimulus and we were at the top of this channel, I'm using my charts to say to myself, I don't know for sure it's going to drop, but man, if there's a time it's going to drop, it's going to be now without stimulus as we've gone up too fast, too soon. And, you know, I'm, I look good now, but it could have gone up too. They could have printed the stimulus. So I just took the approach of, I want to have some cash. So I actually have some cash mm -hmm. on hand now and you know, if that seems a little too micro of you, let, let me zoom out and do something else here. Um, this is November here, and this is the post-election jump we had, okay? There are a lot of folks I know that chose to jump in the market after the election because the market had been beaten down already, so you were getting good valuations. And if you were long-term minded, you could hold, right? But we typically rally to Christmas a lot of the times if the market is doing healthy. Well, that's kind of what happened. We rallied until after Christmas. I know people that arbitrarily took profits here. And even though it dropped and went up again, they just held some cash just in case. You already kind of win, in my mind, if you invest right after the, the March COVID crash and you've experienced some tremendous gains, you don't know that they won't keep going up. But isn't it good to sometimes just have some cash on hand and take some profits? I mean, how do you feel about that? Because you can hold everything long term and just keep adding on dips. But do, do you feel that there's benefit in taking some profits along the way when you've experienced gains in that manner? 
Well, I have lots of cash on the sidelines. I have for years. I actually have more cash on the sidelines in some ways that I would like. But I mean, uh, there's a guy, uh, Warren, Warren, oh, Buffett. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. He always has lots of cash on the sidelines because you're looking for opportunities. So I do, my system combines many systems. And there is an aspect of technical analysis in the system. I'm not so concerned about really short-term kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. In March, as you know, we saw the largest, fastest drop ever in terms of uh, speed. And we saw the fastest recovery ever. Nothing like that ever before. So I have lots of cash on the sidelines. And this, this goes into the market timing again. When markets get badly beaten up, that's when I want to put lots of money into the markets. Odds are I won't hit the bottom. Um, maybe I'll buy some after the bottom, whatever. When markets are really high, I want to be taking some profits. But the profits are based not so much on the macro market. It is part of it. But a lot of it is based on the stocks themselves. And if they okay. hit my target price. Whenever I buy a stock, I set an initial sell target. And Mike, I'm not looking at getting 10 or 20% return. On each stock that I buy, I'm looking at 100% plus, often two, three, 400% plus. And none of that is pie in the sky. Every company has been around at least 10 years. Every company's traded at much higher levels. So I'm looking at turnarounds, companies that are beaten down and it could be because of the corporation itself, it could be because of the sector, or it could be because the whole market is beaten down. And I'll look at some companies and say, there is no reason these companies should be beaten down as badly as they are. And I'll give you a, a sectoral example. After 2008, when you had the banking crisis, I bought an awful lot of US banks. So in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, Many of them have been sold, but right now they're still the largest component of my portfolio, around 35%. So, you know, it, it seemed to me the logic was the American banking system is not going to die. You have to avoid bad banks, which wasn't so easy to do, although I got lucky this time. Um, and I bought a whole bunch of regionals, and then I bought a big one like Bank America at $6 and change. So I, I like that one because I, I didn't see Bank of America going under, partially because I like the CEO, partially because of what it would have done to the American psyche if it went under. That doesn't mean it couldn't go under. I did the same thing last year. I bought uh, Santander Bank, Banco Santander in Spain which is the biggest bank in Spain, one of the biggest in the world. They're also in Brazil, in the States, many other countries. It had been really badly beaten down. And I thought, I can't see this Spanish bank going bankrupt. I put it in the portfolio with $2 and change. Our target price is $8 and change. Again, I always set a target. When it hits the target, odds are I will sell part of it, if not all. But if it hits the target, say in December, I likely won't sell because I want tax deferral, getting into other strategies. And also stocks generally do well at that time of year. So I'd probably wait till the new year. So there's, I, I've combined a lot of different systems. So I'm looking at getting huge gains, but then I'm also trying to get those small one, two, 3% gains that I can, especially if it's short term, because that adds up. Now, I have a question for you on that one. I'm not familiar with that bank that you mentioned, the Spanish uh, banking system there. Now, you mentioned mm -hmm. that, you know, you got in around $2 and you set a target of around $8. I do that, too, with my trades. I try to forecast where, because if you just hold forever, eventually it's going to go down and you have to hope it always goes up. So um, when you say $8, for example, is that because the previous all-time high was $8 or maybe the most recent uh, peak was $8, even though it's been higher than $8? How did you come up with $8? Yeah, it's not because the all-time high was $8. I think that'd be kind of silly to shoot for the all-time high again. It's the uh, lower end of the upper range is what I was looking at. Maybe it was something added on. 
if you go back and look at the chart on that one, you'll see it traded at much higher prices. I mean, same as Bank of America. My target is $38 and change, but it's traded at much higher prices. What's the ticker so, symbol on that one, Bench? Is, is uh, it gonna... S S A N. F F like Frank, F A N? No, S A N. Sam and yeah, perfect. Banco Santander. Right there? Yeah. Okay. So if I zoom out a little bit here. Oh, wow. That was much higher. That was up uh, around five, six dollars here. And if I zoom so out. So go back 10 years. Okay. I'll go on a weekly chart here. Right. You can do annual 10 year chart. So this was around 12, 13 dollars over here. And then you set a target around eight dollars, which would be yeah, eight dollars and change. Okay. The actual get on target is I'm just curious. I think it's eight thirty four. Uh, oh, this is an old one. So this is a current position, and you've currently picked around eight dollars and change as your target. The actual target. Hmm. No, oh, I guess I bought it after this. Yeah, it's eight dollars and change. Oh, there it is. Uh, it's eight twenty-four. Eight twenty-four. Okay. Um, so it went into the portfolio at two hundred five. So basically, I'm looking at a quadruple if I'm right. Um, they stopped paying a dividend because the European regulator wanted the banks to stop paying a dividend. They wanted get back to paying a dividend and they want to grow the dividend. Okay. So Bank America too, they cut their dividend handily. They went from, I forget exactly what it was, but it was fairly high. They cut it to a penny a quarter. And since I bought it, they've raised it four or five times. So now it's 18 cents a quarter. Okay. So I'm getting a great payback, especially if you look at, uh, a dividend of 72 cents on my purchase price of 16 change. It's better than 10%. Now that doesn't matter so much. Now it's a $35 stock. Um, and hopefully to get up to 38 and change. And then I'd like to sell it. So, yeah, and when I'm looking, yes, at, the, when I'm looking yeah. at the chart here, I've never looked at it before, but I mean, we talked about it in the last interview. It's kind of been beaten down here for a while. And like you, you've told me, yep you don't feel that they're going to go into some kind of an Enron type collapse here. You feel that that Spanish banking system will probably turn around and have a bump upwards. So you're buying something that, you know, has taken a beating and then in the coming months or years, you feel that you're going to catch part of the move back up. Yeah. And it could take years. I mean, if you're looking at a quadruple, um, it doesn't matter if it takes 10 years. Of course, most, pe most people wouldn't want that. No. If it doubles in 10 years, that's a 7% return a year, often with a dividend. Now, calculate it if, it if it quadruples in 10 years. I think there's an excellent chance it'll hit 824 well before 10 years. But, I mean, it, it, th this is how we get a lot of our, our great returns. And I love getting dividends. One of my expressions is dividends allow me to be stupid longer <laughs> so if the stock isn't moving or goes down and i'm getting a two percent dividend which is pretty good compared to gic's that's great and an example of that is years ago when i bought into the funeral sector so i bought service and stewart they were the two biggest in the united states the whole sector was badly beaten down because they did so many takeovers and had huge debt loads. They paid dividends and the stocks literally did nothing for years. They went down a bit, up a bit, and then all of a sudden they caught a wave and they quadrupled, went from there. Actually, service took over Stuart. And usually when you have a takeover, it's at a premium. So it was fabulous. Now, as I say that, if I'd been smarter, I would have held longer. Because almost everything we, we sell goes up. It may go down a bit, but then it goes up again. And you mentioned me on BNN. And what a lot of people have told me over the years is one of the things they like about me on BNN is I mention I make mistakes. And I'm very forthright on the mistakes. A lot of people never do it. And I've had people say to me, 
why do you talk about your mistakes so much? And it's fine. I mean, the numbers speak for themselves how well we've done. I mean, when I sold part of the BlackBerry position on this Reddit run, it paid 10, I think 46, sold some at, um, sold 80% at, I think it was 25, 86 maybe, I have to double to 84. I looked to sell the rest over 30, I didn't. So I'm stuck with 20% of the position that's come way down. Uh, If I'd been smarter, I would have sold the rest. Oh, well, (laughs) maybe I have to go get some lobster. I don't know. (laughs) Well, you know what, though? I think it's important to do that because there's a lot of people out there, even just in the online communities that I'm involved in, that only post their winners, and it's often after the fact, and they're ignoring the losers. And I think it's kind of like if you look on social media, everyone's happy, everyone's eating the best food, everyone's wearing the best clothes sometimes, but what's life like behind the camera? And I think that because Mm. you're honest about that, and I'll be honest with you, I do that too. Um, You know, I have losers for sure. We all all have losers. If you're aiming to be perfect, that's a pretty bad strategy in this game, right? If you want to be a perfect baseball player that hits every pitch, you're kind of out to lunch on that one. I mean, good luck. Good luck with that, right? So I go in. If you get three out of ten, you're doing well. Yeah, and I mean, I go in with that attitude in investing. I don't want to hit three out of ten, but I mean, at the end of the day, I want to be aware that it's never going to be 10 out of 10. And I want to be prepared for those mistakes. Um, sometimes I even, you know, I've sold at a loss sometimes before if I feel that COVID just started or a tariff war just started. Sometimes I'll exit a position. Some people will say they only exit green. You could do that too, but what's your strategy? Are you going to dollar cost average? Are you going to do anything to help your position? Be aware that you will have to. Uh, call an audible like in football sometimes and change your view and change your strategy. And I think that's very important. Well, there's a couple of reasons to sell your losers. One is to take tax losses against games. So that can be smart to do. Uh, If you really like the stock, you can buy back in after 30 days after crystallization. But if you've got some, you know, big losers, often it's worthwhile so that you, You don't have to pay your partner, Justin Trudeau, as much money. (laughs) The other reason is if the fundamentals of the corporation have gotten worse. And you look and say, maybe I I made a mistake here. So, again, I know how many mistakes I make. I know to admit a mistake. A lot of people say, you know, one of the best ways to make more money is admit your mistakes and move on. Mm -hmm. Some people believe, and I don't that if you buy a stock and it drops 10%, you should get out. Some people say you should set set stop losses at 10% or 5%. I don't think you should at all. I don't like stop losses. I think they're really dumb. And the reason I say that is because so many of our gainers that we ultimately gained on, we would have have sold out of them. Because you look at almost every stock, I think, at some point they drop 10%. People who are long Tesla still believe in Tesla. They would have been stopped out of it today. Yes. Um, So I have more mental stop losses. I'm looking at things. I'll see one of my stocks got hit. Why did it get hit? But I'm a very patient investor. I'll hold positions for years. You know, average holding years ago, we checked was about three and a half years. A lot of people today go, whoa, how do you, you can't do that. And Mark Bunting used to love to have me on, on BNN. Like, how do you hold for so long? It makes no sense. Actually, he didn't say it makes no sense. He said, how do you do it? And with all the technology out there that is rushing at your brain, it makes it much harder to, to stay the course. But, you know, within that, I like the little nugget there was, I don't like stop losses. Yeah. Um, Many different systems out there. If they work for you, that's great. Um, you know, live, live and learn. And I've learned from my mistakes in the past. And one of the best ways, there's two great ways to learn. One is from your mistakes. I'll make it three ways. One is from what you do right. And the other thing is to read, read and read. And I know you're a big reader, if I remember correctly. So it's absolutely critical to read all kinds of books. And I'll just bring up one other book. It's not mine. 
can see it on the screen. Robin will be happy. Market it's Master. called Market Masters. And this was written by a guy, uh, Robin Speziali. It became a bestseller. And he follows uh, 28 um, people he calls great investors. Came out a number of years ago. And he actually had me first in the book. And I have an ego too. And it felt great. It felt great. And the book's done well. And uh, I admire Robin. But in Market Masters, if you want to read a book and what a lot of people do and how they do it, uh, that's another one that you might want to put on your list. It is very, very thick, just to warn you. Um, so for people who don't like thick books, um, they might want to read something that's hard to get, like Where Are All the Customers' Yachts, <laughs> which I think came out in the 1920s or something which is a brilliant book. And it's basically saying, wait, the stockbrokers have it all. The institutions have all the money. Why don't the customers have yachts? Because those people are supposed to be working for the investors. And it, it's a funny book. It's a bit of a send up, but there's a lot of good information in it. And I'll just say for anybody who, who decides to order the Contrarian Investors 13, and as you mentioned, they can go to our website at Contra the Herd, at the back, I list a lot of books that they might want to read. Oh, um, okay. And it, some of them, they're not my system, and some of them aren't obviously investing books. But I think they have a lot of it, validity. Like I talk about Henry David Thoreau Walden, which is a fabulous book. And he talked about economies and things like that and lifestyle. And it's one of the books that, had a huge impact on me. And I remember I suggested it to Ben Statham and my business partner. And he was living and working in Calgary at the time. And he started the book. And then he said, he was, I don't know, 25, 30 pages. And he said, I've got to go back because I wasn't focused enough on it. And this book was written, I don't know how many years ago, I'll say 150, I'm not sure, but a long time ago. But there's a lot of classics and there's a lot of new ones. And I also think it's important you know, in terms of what's going on now with Reddit and Wall Street bets, if you had asked me what was going to happen with them and what they were all about a month ago, I would have said, I, I don't know them. I didn't follow them. <laughs> and then in the course of about three days, when two of our stocks were going crazy, which was BlackBerry and Koss, if you want to look at a crazy stock, KOSS, going from a few dollars to $127, um, then I learned a lot in three days. You know, it was like a, a course that I did. <laughs> I don't know that I know a lot about them, but I've included a little something in my investing system. So if I'm looking at a stock and think those people might jump on it in the future, that, that could be interesting. So you've got to stay current at the same time look back. Da -da -da. Yellow. <laughs> And you know what? I agree with a lot of what you said. So, I mean, like, you know, I enjoy reading certain books. I also enjoy watching people speak. And I mean, you can find one or two hour interviews or TED Talks from different people about investing. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, you know, we talked about just like life and happiness, too. Like there's some books that are not directly connected to investing in a stock behind me, too. And um, I think I have mentioned you before, Brett Wilson. I have a book of his here, Redefining Success. It's not all about money too, right? It's all about life balance and things like that. Uh, I have The Art of War, a book behind me. Every battle is won mm -hmm. before it's fought, you know? And there's- I read, I read that years ago. It's a great book. It's a great book. And it has nothing to do with stocks, but it has everything to do with stocks because it, it's just- And how, how long ago was that written? Oh, I don't even, that's ancient, right? But- um, It's ancient. Yeah, it's ancient. Even Tony Soprano likes that book. Everyone, everyone uh, has- uh, some use for those philosophies, but it, it's a different way of looking at things. And uh, I like to stay current with what's going on on CNBC beyond just the obvious scary headlines and diving into the details. Um, and it's one of those things where you have to be be careful what you listen to and do the work, right? You, you have to treat it uh, with some seriousness. The other thing to mention, you know, you talked about holding for a long period of time. Uh, myself and some of the listeners, we might be shorter term in nature sometimes compared to yourself, but there's aspects of what we do uh, that are definitely long term. I mean, 
Uh, I own physical gold and silver I've had for a long time. I've been holding Bitcoin for a while. I own real estate I've been holding for a while. There's different things. Everyone's got a different strategy and someone who might even be shorter term in nature in one investment style might be longer term in nature in one of their other mm -hmm. investments. And that's, it's all about having a mix. Um, I'm going to show you one thing here. So, you know, I, I have uh, different coins and metals and things like that. And uh, so silver and gold. This is a bar. This is a bar of silver right here. Okay, so this is uh, huh. I think ten ounces of of silver. It's in a protective sleeve. I've got a bunch of these. I've got silver coins. I've got gold. I've got stuff that I've had for a while. And the price of silver dropped for years, but now maybe it'll go back up again. It's just a long term investment. It's a hedge to my wealth. Okay, and one of the reasons you might say, you know, why does Mike own silver or why is Ben holding the stock so long? This is something else that I, I bought. I've given some of these away to friends as a uh, one of them has it in their living room. It's a conversation piece now. So do you know do you know what this is, Benj? Hold on. Let's see if you recognize this. Have you ever seen one of these? Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. I guess that that uh, isn't worth the paper that it's printed on. Well, it's a hundred trillion dollars. <laughs> and um what happened yeah. was there's pictures online where there's people with wheelbarrows full of money going to buy some bread and eggs, mm -hmm. okay? And funny enough, they canceled it. This is not legal tender anymore. It's worth more than ever now. I think I paid 20 bucks for these, and they're worth 60 or 80 bucks now. Now they're going up in value as a collectible because when I show this to people, I gave these to some of my best friends, and I said, this is something to look at, and it's a lesson in time, just like the tulip bubble mm -hmm. or anything like that. And to me, it's about the fact that over time, uh, we tend to devalue our currencies. And when you devalue a currency, you have to give up more of your dollars to buy stuff, whether it's a home, whether it's a stock, whether it's an ounce of silver. If they keep devaluing the currencies enough, which seems to be what they're doing, right? Devaluation combined with lower and lower interest rates, that means you have to pay more for things and people have access to more cash to bid on things. And so I've taken that approach on a long-term view. That's why I have some gold and silver. That's why I invested in some Bitcoin. And that's why I have stocks because after the money printing, what happened? Yeah, and a friend of mine gave me Argentinian pesos years ago when they also had hyperinflation. And I, his wife's from there and I was using it at bookmark for quite a while. <laughs> Venezuela is having the same problem. I've lived in many places over the years. When I worked in, in, in the Middle East, I saw the shekel going down every day. But yeah, currencies certainly do change. And a very important thing is to diversify. And it was funny, I just read a quote by Elon Musk. He said, you don't have to diversify, basically. And I have a, a Twitter account. And uh, I read this somebody put up there and I, and I said, oh, I, I disagree. And then I looked at what Elon has and I could have my numbers wrong, but it's like 123 billion in Tesla, a lot of money in Bitcoin and in other assets, house, cars, etc. he had $7 billion. Mm -hmm. Well, as a percentage of his assets, it was relatively small. But when you've got $7 billion in other assets kicking around, you've diversified. Mm -hmm. So diversified is important. Diversification is important. How far do you have to diversify? So some people say you can own as few as six stocks. Some people say I want to own a mutual fund or an ETF with 50 stocks or more. To me, owning that many stocks is silly because I prefer to choose the best stocks. Mm -hmm. The best stocks meaning the ones that have been badly beaten down that I think will turn around. So in the contra, contra portfolio that I manage, I normally have 15 to 25. And I think I can get good diversification that way. Right now, I've got a bit more in banking than I would like. But since there's four banking stocks, there is diversification there. It's not like it's all in Bank of America. But diver diversification is key. Um, I own a a couple gold companies, SSR Mining. Uh, I own some Olivana. I actually have a little bit of physical gold and silver, which I never 
bother to look at. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to diversify. And I mean, one of the greatest things to own is a house. But even with the house, the question is when to buy, when to sell. And the two most important things there is trying to buy when the market's down. It does go down. I remember in 94, when I was looking for my first house, they had got it, market had gotten killed. I actually didn't buy then. I didn't buy until uh, my son, Kalen was about to be born in, um, in 2000. And when you sell, your last sale is important. You want the market to be high. But houses are generally a, a good investment. And the key is if you live there and you're happy there, that's key. So right now, housing seems high. But when I bought this house that I'm in 14 years ago, I thought we're not getting a good deal. We're doing all right on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, it's worth a lot more than it was then. And since I'll be downsizing when I sell this, which won't be for a long time, if you're downsizing, then it can work out as an even better deal because you have a lot of money on the sidelines. And who knows, maybe I'll go to a condo, an apartment, <laughs> or maybe I'll get lucky enough and they'll carry me out of here in about 25 years. Um, you can come and watch, have a parade, uh, eat some lobster. You know, <laughs> I like recurring things. Um, but yeah, diversification is important. But again, also, in one of the chapters in that book is be aware of over diversification. And people don't talk about over diversification generally, but that can be a danger. I, I agree with everything you just said. I mean, it, it, you know, I'll, here's the problem. If you're listening to advice from, you know, experts or, or smart investors online, I, I've seen an interview with Mark Cuban saying diversification is for idiots because he said, if you know, you know, if you know what you're doing, you, you, you go hard at it. But, you know, he might have a different approach that won't work for someone else, you know, maybe, maybe, and maybe he is diversified in the view that you took and he's not stating that at the end of the day, though. You're going to have experts telling you to put 2% into 50 different things. You might have someone else saying put 25% into four things. And you have to figure out for yourself what you want to do. So even though you're giving certain advice, they're going to hear some money managers saying put 2% into 50 different things. Who do you listen to? And that at the end of the day, whether it's real estate or stocks or anything, there's so many different views coming at you that people get frustrated, I believe. Uh, in the end, once they've chosen one of those paths. And I would bet if you look at Mark Cuban's assets, it might be similar, not the same, but like uh, Musk, I would bet that he's pretty well diversified. Let's just start with the Dallas Mavericks. For sure. Um, I don't know what they're worth. I, I'm guessing that he's got a few houses. He probably makes uh, a few bucks from... It's not Dragon's Den. What's that other one that he's on? <laughs> oh, yeah, that U.S. one. Um, Dragon's Den was there before. So I think that he is probably very well diversified. Um, I, I'd be happy to look at, over his assets if he wants me to <laughs> and decide whether he's diversified or not. Well, and the thing is, too, when you hear his interview, in my mind, he was speaking about only his stock portfolio. But, the, you know, when you, when you hear it... Um, you might not realize that he maybe he's not diversifying as much as other people are in his stock portfolio, but he's covered in his life and his overall wealth. He has diversification. So um, I think people need to be careful listening to that because Mark Cuban is going to make his real money in his business and he doesn't, you know, he, he's treating his stock portfolio a little differently, I think. So, um, yeah, that, that could be. So, yeah, you have to, you have to analyze it. You have to try and look through and, and think about it. Um, but yeah, I'm sure he's got that diversification now and a, lo a lot of people forget what it's about. Definitely. Definitely. And I mean, just going into the last five, 10 minutes here, I just wanted to kind of tie into the whole thing about, you know, money devaluation and how we invest over the long term. Um, there's people right now that might be scared. The market's about to roll over and they're going to lose more money if they hold or try to buy the dip. Um, there's people waiting for stimulus. There's people calling for crashes. There's all kinds of stuff going on right now, right? COVID could get worse all of a sudden, all this stuff. How, what's your advice to people uh, if they want to make it through the market? Because if, you, if you're tunnel visioned and you're looking at what's in front of you, you're just going to be reacting to every headline 
and you're going to sell while it's dropping and hold while it's going up and doing a lot of those common mistakes that you mentioned that people do. What's your advice to people who feel maybe it's kind of boring and they're not patient to be as a long-term investor, but they also realize that the short-term stuff can be quite wild. How, what's, what's your advice to someone on how to balance that out? Well, again, I think a major problem is people are constantly looking at their iPhone, you know, they're the push technology, um, there's screens all the time. I always set a sell target when I buy something, as mentioned before, that grounds me. As I said, the way we're dealing with market timing, I won't reiterate, but that, that, that grounds me. I think that's critical. And I, I think you have to know if you miss buying certain stocks, you know, another train always comes along. You have to know that stock's going to be beaten down. And something like Santander that we talked about, I'm not looking at the historical high. I'm looking towards the bottom end. And also, again, think that there's more to life. I'm actually going through a bit of a transition now in terms of I wanted to get on some corporate boards. And I got invited on two. One is Data Metrics. And it's just a venture company. I never invested in venture before. The other is Char Technologies. And data, data metrics is a, it's a small company. Um, they're into AI, they're into to COVID testing, but they also are into uh, blockchain. And stock just went crazy because their uh, graph blockchain went wild literally in the past week. So for me to be on the board and dealing internally is quite fascinating. Chart Technologies also, I joined the board six months ago as a 10 cent stock, as was Data Metrics when I joined it. It's now 50 cents and change. It was up as high as 70. So what I'm doing in some ways is, is a bit of renewal. And I'm looking at doing different things. I want to keep my mind going. I want to try and ward off that Alzheimer's. And Mike, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, <laughs> probably a lot of people who follow you don't have to worry about it yet but I'm constantly trying to exercise my brain. And now that I'm on the boards of these companies and dealing with some pretty interesting people and dealing with something that I haven't dealt with before, it's great for me. It's even better because they're doing well, although Chara didn't move quite a while and uh, data metrics, it's gone, it's gone well generally. Mm -hmm. um, but that's fascinating. People should look, What's your passion? What's something new you want to do? I started playing piano when I was about 50 because my son, Calum, he was starting. He was about uh, four years, five years old. And learning a, an instrument is like learning another language. And that's great for the brain. So I said, okay, I'm going to do it. I played trombone and violin in school okay. for one and two years. I was brutal. <laughs> I was also brutal on piano, but it was good. And Kalen learned a lot. And then his brother, Christoph learned. But again, part of it was to do something different. It was to challenge myself. It was to keep those uh, neurons and those synapses firing. And I think that's very important. Find an interest and follow it. Sometimes find a new interest. One other thing I'll throw it in. Almost every day I go on a walk. It can be 15 minutes, it can be 45 minutes, or I do something active or I try to. And when I'm on the walk, I don't have on, <coughs> excuse me, headphones or anything. I think, I listen, I watch. And that can be great to come up with ideas. I also lie around more now just to think, <laughs> which I didn't used to do so much. Yeah, and you know, the thing is too that uh, it's, uh, there, it is important to unwind like that and, um, to do some things that make you happy. And uh, sometimes I'll go for on, on a walk and I do put music on, but it's my favorite song, songs that give me a certain feeling or a certain headspace that make me actually appreciate the nature a little more sometimes. For me anyways, uh, you see a guitar behind me. I, I like music a lot. So that's something for me, but it is important to unwind and take care of yourself because um, if you don't take care of yourself, everything falls apart at the end of the day. So, um, you know, we can use all the strategies we want, but if, if you're stressing out and you're not sleeping and you're not healthy and you're not happy, it's going to be pretty hard to be a successful investor, right? So, And, the, and one of the rules is invest so you can sleep at night. 
Yeah. And that's, that's key. It's absolutely key. You don't want to be really stressed. You know, the major reason that the couples break up, it, often it's money, arguing about money. Uh, and money is very important. I finish off the uncommon investor by saying, often money costs too much. And I think that's it's important. You want to make money, you want to do well, you want to go on those trips. And I apologize for the phone. That's okay. But at the same time, it can cost too much. And I think that's absolutely critical. So a, a big, an important thing is to keep it in, in context. You want to know you can pay the mortgage. You want to know you can pay the rent. You want to know that you've got food coming in and on the table. You want to know you can go see the movie, maybe take that trip. But at the same time, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're really stressed because life is not fun. Then. No. And at the end of the day, I always tell people, you know, I mean, depending on everyone that are different, in a different age or a different position, but I always tell people from my perspective, I have the rest of my life to invest and make money. I better enjoy it along the way. And I better not try to necessarily get rich quick because that can be a trap for people if you over leverage or you over bet or you over mm -hmm. assume. And if you're always betting as if it's going to go up, you're going to get killed every year at some point. And sometimes it's good to have cash, even if you don't know it's going to drop. It's you, if you're always leveraged, if you're always betting forward, it works great a lot of the times, but there's moments like the COVID drop, and the trade war and the tsunami and all these other events that we're aware of that it doesn't feel that great and you can't predict them. So l allow yourself to sleep at night by positioning yourself to be prepared for those bad times. And one, one thing, I, I don't use leverage at all. I don't use margin at all. And I never have. Um, that doesn't mean other people shouldn't. Different systems. You can get far better returns by doing it. Basically, I put money on the table and I hope the stock will go up at some point in the future. So that's what I do, which makes it a lot easier to sleep. Uh, my father-in-law, one of his adages was, um, I don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard. And he unfortunately has passed on and too young, but you want to spend some of your money on things that you enjoy and enjoy living on a daily basis. It's not always easy every day. There can be challenges. Um, when the kids are young and they're not sleeping and you hardly get any sleep, you know, it can be a challenge, but you have to deal with it. But again, you don't just want to save money so that you die and you haven't enjoyed it. It's important. Yeah, I, I had to learn that. It's a tough thing for people to learn. And, and you know, sometimes people, uh, I, I come from Italian immigrants. They came here with nothing off of farms. And uh, some of them uh, did what you're saying. And then there's other people I know that they come from such rough times that they're always kind of prepared for the next Great Depression. And they're always kind of living mm -hmm. in a bit of fear. But, you know, it, it's, it's kind of finding that balance and enjoying yes. different things. You know, it, it's... You don't want to always be too fearful, but you don't always want to assume times will be great. You have to find that balance for you. And uh, I think some pe sometimes people are coming from bad stresses in their lives or bad past mm -hmm. experiences, and it affects their future outlook and the way they live their lives. So it's, it's important to be able to master this on top of investing mm -hmm. in the market, right? Investing. What I mean by that is mastering your mind and your psyche and your overall view of things, right? So... I, I should be writing all this down. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Like, I, I've always been somewhat of an optimist and, you know, life can be worse. Don't sweat the small stuff. Uh, I've even got a Tony Robbins book behind me. And just, you know, th there's there's different ways to approach things and deciding what is success and uh, what is my roadmap going forward. And I think that that's really a big, big, big part of it. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's all good stuff. Now, one other question, just to throw back, go dive a little bit back into things here. A lot of my listeners right now, it's the 23rd of February. I think one big question they would have for you, Benj, would be, uh, when do you think that stimulus is coming for Joe Biden? When is that stimulus coming? Is it going to come in March like everyone's kind of assuming? 
Do you feel that's a, a tricky thing to assume? And if we get that stimulus, is that a safe time to invest? Is it going to be something where the market's going to be bullish again for a while? This is really short-term stuff. Uh, you're looking at $1.9 trillion. Uh, Biden, I was watching a bit of an interview with him today saying, some people say it's too much. Where do they want me to cut back? Where do you, they want me to cut back? And I, I responded, said, I'd be happy to tell you where to cut back. Um, you can pay me the U.S. minimum wage, the federal minimum wage. I think it's $750, mm -hmm. and it hasn't gone up in forever. I would accept that. They're, I think they're throwing way too much money into the system. Things aren't as bad as they're making it look like. When we get through COVID, things will pick up again. So I, I think that it'll probably come fairly soon. Um, and does it really matter if it comes next week or in a month? I don't really think so. But I think the Canadian gover government's been way overspending. Looks like they're going to spend way more. There's been some pushback about putting another $100 billion into the system. On my Twitter account, I wrote six months ago, I bet I could find $50 billion in savings, <laughs> what they're doing, overspending. I wrote about a month ago, you know, over $100 billion I could find, no problems. It's like they've been throwing money at the wall and hoping it'll stick, and a lot of it's been really stupid. Um, so I don't know. If, if people are interested in the contrarian method of investing, how we do things, how to stay the course, if they order the book, I'm happy to send them a, a, a historical copy of our investment letter, send them a bunch of emails, give them an idea what we do when we buy and sell. They can check out the website. The investment letter is $680 a year. Um, after the first year, we allow people to renew it for two and three years. The three-year rate is actually lower, but we don't allow people to do it at the beginning simply because we want them to know our system. Mm -hmm. how we do and as i said we've been doing this a long time um we've got a good team the team's been together a long time ben and i have known each other from our western days at university lloyd i've known since 1989 mark's been with us 15 years phil's pushing us. um and bill has been writing for us for a few years in, in nova scotia just a few years but people have joined on with us and they've stayed. And we know who we are, we know our strengths, we know our weaknesses. And if anybody wants to just email me and ask questions, shoot me an email at G-A-L-L, -L, like my last name, at pathcom, P-A-T-H-C-O-M dot com. Uh, G-A-L-L -L at pathcom.com. I'm happy to answer your questions. You don't have to be a subscriber. Um, I'm usually pretty good at getting back to people within 48 hours. Well, that's a really nice of you to, to do that. I mean, I can link that information there into the details of the video there for everyone as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like that you have the, the view that you have on things and it's more of a long-term focus and it's served you well and you have compounding interest you've experienced for many years mm -hmm. and that's kind of. In, in some ways, that, that, that does make you sleep at night because you have the ability to rely on those long-term returns. And if you do some other investments along the way, that's great, right? But uh, you know that you're safe the way that you're, you're doing things. And because there's cash there, I mean, some people say you should have three or six months cash sitting there for an emergency or if something happens. I mean, COVID was the perfect example. I mean, I... I have money, I think, that would last for years unless we see that hyperinflation that we alluded to. Then it could be a different ball game. but I'm diversified enough I could catch some things in. So, you know, it's there, the money's there, and again, can sleep at night because of it. And that's the most important part at the end of the day, right? So, um, yeah, that's really good stuff. I, I like that we went over a diverse number of topics. You know, again, it's not all just about mm -hmm. charts, charts and stocks. It's also about life balance and, uh, you know, just yeah. being able to interpret the information that's coming at you because there's a lot of it as well. So, um, well, th th this has been great. And you, you were talking about on the net. There's a lot of interviews with me on YouTube. Anybody just wants to throw my name in. 
uh, tons of articles. Um, some of them are fairly short, five minutes, others 45 minutes. But this one's a good place to start. I like to think, as you say, we've covered a lot of a lot of territory and much more than investing. And I want to thank you. It's been uh, good, lots of fun, and I, I do appreciate your wisdom. I appreciate that. That means a lot. Like I said, I, I kind of started investing by looking up to you and some of the other folks on TV. So it's been kind of a journey for me to get to the point where, um, you know, I'm talking to you now, actually, it's pretty cool. And uh, you've been really, really nice and really, really courteous. And I appreciate that as well on uh, giving me your time, obviously, right? You're a busy guy as well. So thank you so much for providing your insights to the audience as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I look forward to my when I'm going to Niagara on the lake to drink a whole bunch of wine and eat well, I'm looking forward to stopping in St. Catharines and breaking bread with you, sir. <laughs> well, you know what? If I if I have some good food to share with you, maybe we can share some of that nice Italian cooking with you or something. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you warning. I'll, I'll let you know a few days ahead. I'm hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that would be very nice, actually. And uh, we have a lot of nice things here. I live in near Niagara Falls here, Niagara on the Lake area. And we have a lot of beautiful nature and a lot of good wine and good food here too. So uh, mm -hmm. that's very, very nice. Good. Well, thank you again for giving us your time. I think everyone's going to enjoy seeing the insights here. I'll uh, have my goal of getting it up this week and we'll link in your website and we'll link everything in so everyone knows how to find you. And uh, do you have any closing words for the audience? I just want to say, you know, don't be impatient. Um, plan ahead, be smart with your investments, and don't get caught up in all the hype. And this is a time of absolutely huge hype. And make sure you're cynical. Make sure you're cynical so that you can look through what a lot of the people are saying um, and enjoy life. Get out there and, you know, smell the roses. Go to Point Pelion, go bird watching. There you go. Life is short. Make sure you enjoy it and smile while you still have teeth, right? That's that's what I like to say. You got to enjoy the there ride. There you go. So perfect. Very good. Okay. Thank you again, Benj, and um, we'll uh, we'll keep in touch. And uh, thank you again for taking the time with us. Okay, I appreciate it. Okay, Mike. Take care. Take care. Wish you all the best. And look forward to next time. Okay. Take care, Benj. Bye bye.